Welcome to the Vita Day Bible School. My name is Richard Boeta and I'm doing this recording from a little town in the Western Cape of the Republic of South Africa called Hermanus. South Africa is right at the tip of the continent of Africa and um, we are talking about Paul's letter to the Colossians. We are in Colossians chapter 1 and let's let's just read from verse 3 and then we can just continue where we left off with the previous recording. So Paul writes, he says, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. We also continue to the last recording reading from verse 9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So that's our last reading. That was right in the middle of a sentence that Paul was busy writing. It continues in verse 10. I just want to, before we read verse 10, just want to refresh your memory and mine about what we talked about in the last recording. Your love in the Spirit, that was one phrase we, we mentioned, we, we also read it just now. Uh, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, His choice of words there, talking about Jesus as the Lord, your love in the Spirit. And then, as we shall see, praying that we, or the Colossians, might be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. There is one thing that is very clear of the gospel that Paul was preaching, and that was that salvation through Jesus is available through the Lordship of Jesus. Jesus is first and foremost the Lord, not only of the universe, not only of earth, but also of our lives. He is the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord that means master or boss even, to put it crudely. And when, when Paul mentions about their love in the Spirit, that phrase, love in the Spirit, doesn't mean anything else than your love that you have for one another under the influence or the authority or the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It is this, it's driven by the Spirit of God and you yield to to His driving force in your life. You yield to Him. You yield to the Lord Jesus. He is the Lord and Master. And you yield to the rule of Christ in your lives through the Spirit of God. You yield to Him. That's a very important thing to understand, especially as we read that Paul prays for them that they might be filled with the will of God. We, we refer to the fact that we were born with a driving force within us, driving us towards our own will, what we want and how we want it and when we want it. That our will was, before we met Christ, was the driving force in our lives. Our emotions, our interests, our lives, our wants, our needs. We were the epitome of our existence. You know, we were the center of the universe. And then we heard the gospel of Christ. We came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, of sin, because we do not believe that He is who He said He is, and He says He is the center of the universe. I am not the center. There was this important place where, where I, let's say, where I got. I got to this specific place. I was brought to a specific place in my life by the Holy Spirit. We understand that from Jesus' teaching in John chapter 16, 
where I was convicted, strongly convicted by the Holy Spirit that there is a God and it's not me and that the driving force of my life is not my will but His will and that Jesus is the the image of the invisible God or He's the revelation of who God is and His revelation of being Lord is where my salvation lies. And as I lay down my life before Him, that's what it means to come to faith in Christ. I come to the conviction that He is who He said He is. And, and therefore, because I believe that, that He is who He said He is, I lay down my life before Him. Now those two things are uh, inseparable from one, from one another. You can't just profess faith in Christ if you do not act faith in Christ. So those two go together. Professing and acting uh, your faith in Christ is what public, the biblical definition of faith is. So we're going to see this, how he writes to these believers. Now they had a crisis in their midst and the crisis um, in all probability had to do with people coming into this congregation and influencing them, um, uh, turning them, turning their hearts and their focus and even their minds, turning it away from the supremacy and position of Christ. That's why Paul majors on who Jesus is. So some of the most wonderful revelations of the identity of Jesus is found in this letter, which is profound and and stirring, deeply moving in our hearts to understand and know who Jesus really is. And I'm, I'm so grateful to God that this letter was uh, protected, you know, can we still have this, the content of this letter and can read it today and understand who our Lord and Master really is, that He is everything, that He is the center of the universe, He is the reason for creation, and He is the Creator. So, the, the, Paul starts this letter with this wonderful uh, and powerful reminder that as they received Christ, they need to continue in Him. How did they receive Him? They received Him as Lord and Master. And as they received Him as Lord and Master, they also came to know Him as uh, Savior, Jesus Christ our Savior. Because He's my Lord, He is my Savior. There is no saving without the Lordship of Christ. Now, that is a, a, a profound or an important uh, aspect or character trait of the gospel as we read about it in scripture. So your love in the spirit actually means your love for one another driven by the spirit. You have love, the spirit drives you towards obedience to God through Christ Jesus and the fruit of that obedience is love towards one another and you yield to the spirit they, the, that's why the love is evident. So since we heard about your faith in Jesus Christ and your love for the saints, we, 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 you know, we were praying for you um, without ceasing. And what they prayed, so let's, let's go there then in Colossians 1 verse, let's do 9 and 10. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Yes, that's right. Let's pick it up there. So my driving force before I came to faith in Christ was my will, how I want things done and what I want to you know, accomplish in my life. I I was the motivation and inspiration and driving force, my interests and my wants. Now, as I lay down my life before Christ, and He is the Lord, now He is the center of the universe, He is the master, His will is now the driving force in my life. It's an absolute radical night and day change that happened in my life. So the will of God is now important, not mine. And, and this is this is crucial because in our daily living, we we have interactions with people, and there are many situations uh, fr in our day-to-day -day living uh, uh, that demands um, that demands reactions from us. We react; things happen, and we react. Now, w what is what is amazing is that in before I met Christ, the standard of my reaction 
I determined what the standard of my reaction is. So you react in this way, I react in a way that I deem fit, that I deem uh, proper for this specific situation. I determine and, and I execute. I do what I want to do and as I think is best how to react in this way. The life of the disciple of Christ totally changed in that regard. I, I'm still in this life. I still have day-to-day -day situations. Uh, I still have contact with people and, and there are still things happening. You know, life happens around me. But the standard of my reaction is no longer determined by what I want to do. It is henceforth determined by what he wants to do. And this is the major, the major emphasis. So we, we understand that, uh, it, well, in, in the, the world that I live in here in South Africa, you will hear a lot of preaching about living uh, from, you know, from the authority of God, from the, you know, you have the authority and exercise the authority of God. Uh, that's a major, major topic in preaching where, where we are, where we live. But when I read scripture, I see the main emphasis is living, living under the authority of Christ, submitting to the authority of Christ, uh, which is the major focus of, of the Christian walk. There is a Lord and it's not me. So I submit to him and whatever he decides, even if I don't like it, even if I don't understand it, whatever he decides, I yield to and I submit to. And, and that affects me in everything that I do. My entire life is affected by this radical truth coming from the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he says, uh, I pray that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, which which is the logical outflow of what we're talking about now. My entire life consists of submitting to Christ. Why? Because He and He alone is the Lord and Master. And there is only one way, only one way of walking worthy, uh, in a manner worthy of the Lord, and that is to submit to his will, to do whatever he says, even if it's not logical. So I do what he says, I submit myself to him. And where you can see that the most is in how I relate to people around me. That's why Paul you know, mentions your faith in Christ and your love towards the saints. He put those two together. They're inseparable from one another. How I relate to people will demonstrate to you in what way do I submit to the will of God. Uh, that's why Jesus also told his disciples in John chapter 13, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. That will be the showcase. That will be the exhibition of your discipleship. That will be the, the final testimony, the absolute testimony, as a matter of fact, of your submission to Christ, which is what discipleship means. Discipleship means the process, the learning, the life under the authority of Christ, submitting to His will and obeying Him and, and letting, letting Him form you from the inside out through submitting to Him. That's discipleship. So how will people know that you are submitting to Christ? Because it's so easy to say, yes, yes, I submit to Christ, it will be evident. Where will it be evident? It will be evident in the way I treat people. And that's where you can see I, I truly submit to Christ. So the only way to walk uh, uh, in a manner worthy of the Lord is to submit to Him. That's why Paul prays, his absolute heart for these believers is that they might be filled with the will of God. Now, they are already filled with the will of God. They, they already understand and came to know the will of God. Paul's prayer is for the continuous filling and the continuous knowledge of the will of God and the expansion of that knowledge in all wisdom and spiritual understanding in all areas of their lives. And so he continues with his letter, saying, writing further. He says, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. 
Now, this is an interesting thing. There are, I think Paul mentions three things that would be the effect of being filled with the will of God, understanding what he wants uh, and not what I want. Submitting to his will instead of mine, because he is the Lord and Master, not I. Three things, three effects of being filled with the knowledge of God. And the one is that I can please him bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And that is, you know, that is such a, a powerful thought. I read in uh, John chapter 14 where Jesus says, uh, he writes, uh, John writes about this in verse 15, verse 21, verse 23, I think verse 24 also alludes to that, where he says, if you love me, do what I say. Then he writes, and it is quite revolutionary, you can read it for yourself, maybe take time now, just pause the video and quickly read John 14, verse 21 and 23, for example. Um, there are many other examples. Chapter 13 uh, uh, you know, has examples uh, of the same kind. Chapter 15 and so forth. So there are many chapters you can refer to. But John will write Jesus saying, If you love me, do what I tell you, and I will love you, and the Father will love you, and I will reveal myself to you. That is verse 21. Now that is a, that's a profound statement, important one, a hefty one. There's, you know, there's, there's content to this statement, which reminds me of just a chapter, uh, you know, the next chapter further on. In chapter 15, Jesus says, I call you my friends if you do what I tell you, which is a, a conditional clause. I call you my friends if you do what I tell you. I will believe that you love me if you do what I tell you. Verse uh, chapter 14. And if you do what I tell you, meaning you love me, the Father will love you, and I will reveal myself to you. Now, there's a, there's a let's call it a secret um, embedded in, in that statement, and that is the secret of Jesus reveals himself to me, and I submit to his will. I obey him. I do what he says. And as I do what he says, he reveals himself to me more. It's not a once-off thing. It's a continuous journey that he takes me on until the time that I see him face to face. From now until he returns or I die, whatever comes first, that is the journey that I'm on. The journey is knowing Christ, obeying Christ, knowing Christ, obeying Christ. As I obey him, he reveals himself to me and I know him. I obey him. As I obey him, he reveals and so forth. And this is an important thing. It is repeated in verse 23. This was, I just cited verse 21. If you love me, do what I tell you and I will love you and the Father will love you and I will reveal myself to you. In verse 23, Jesus says, if you love me, do what I tell you and the Father will love you and we will come to you and make our, um, I think, make our, we will live with you. Sorry, I'm translating from the Afrikaans now and it doesn't really work in English, but you can read it for yourself in, uh, in verse 23. So the first effect of being filled with what God wants is that I bear fruit in every good work. Uh, this is, what is this, verse 10? And increase in the knowledge of God. You see the increasing in the knowledge of God? I think some people, uh, and I know for sure this was the case with the believers in Corinth. So you can read about it in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 and 2 Corinthians. They believed that they gained a special knowledge of God through uh, special uh, spiritual revelations or experiences. And, uh, and so they, they placed a, a huge emphasis on mysticism and, and all kinds of so-called spiritual experiences. And the one with more spiritual or deeper spiritual experiences know more about God. Well, Scripture says, don't be fooled. Those who obey Christ 
will get to know Christ. Those who are filled with the knowledge of His will and submit to what He says and do what He says, they to them will be revealed uh, the heart and the truth and the glory of God, ever increasing. So that's the first effect of being filled with the knowledge of God. Being strengthened with all power, which is, let's call this, the second effect. Being filled with the knowledge of God and submitting to that, I will bear fruit in all good works and please Him, walk in a way worthy of the Lord. And in submitting to Him in my everyday life, knowing His will, submitting to His will, I am also strengthened, which is a wonderful thing to understand. You know, we will, we will often pray for strength, and which is which is good, wonderful, and we, we are encouraged to pray for strength, but that is not all there is to it. As we read scripture, um, there there is a place where I can um, experience the strength of God, the 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 presence of God strengthening me in the inside by submitting to Him, and as I submit to Him, He strengthens me. Now. You, that you can't pray for. You, you can't decide not to submit to God, to do your own thing as you understand it and as you want it, and then still pray for the strength of God to come on your life, you see? So that's the one thing. There is, there is this, um, uh, un, this is, that is not debatable. Uh, there is this road, this journey we need to follow as disciples of Christ, to submit to Him and continuously submit to Him, continuously heed His will. And as we do that, we experience God. He is being revealed to us. He strengthens us. And our lives are lives that, that please Him, which is a powerful thing to say. So if we read, read further, he says, um, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, which is such a, uh, a, a f breath of fresh air uh, to, to hear because it's defined. God will strengthen us towards what? And then he says towards endurance and patience with joy. Now, you know why I like this so much? I like it because it, it sets parameters, it sets boundaries, uh, it defines what Paul is talking about. And that is, is you know, that is important to me as uh, people are prone to read things in Scripture and then give it their own spin or own twist or own meaning and make something of it that wasn't the intended meaning. So we can read, God will strengthen me and then we have our own images in our mind of what this strengthening uh, means and how it will play out. And, and, and we can move into directions that, that Scripture is not talking about, that God is not talking about. So Paul says, the strengthening of God will give you endurance and patience with joy. Endurance Meaning, there will, be, there will be crises in your life. And there will be difficult circumstances. There will be tough times. And as you submit to the will of God, He will give you the strength to endure those times. To go through them. Now, let me, let me just be frank with you. It would have been... It would have been much better for my ears if I heard Paul said, and if you do what God wants, he will keep you from all crises and all tough times and all, you know, difficult circumstances. That would have been great, which is what many people in, in my town believe. They believe that if you are truly a Christian and truly, if you understand who you are in Christ, then you will be the master of all difficult circumstances and you will never, it will never, you know, it will, it will never overcome you. You will be the master and you will command and you will proclaim and you will determine and you will be the boss of everything. 
you will be this bastion of might and power, which is not what Scripture is saying. There are many circumstances in our lives that is just absolutely unbearable. Would I have loved to, to be rid of those circumstances? Yes, yes, absolutely, I would have. But often, God doesn't take me out of the crisis, but He walks with me through the crisis. Now, here is the important emphasis. He is the master. He is the bastion or the tower of strength. He is the power. He is the deliverance. Not me. But He will give me something that is supernatural. He will give me supernatural enablement, strength, to endure those circumstances, even if they destroy my life. Can they? Yes, they can. If you, if you don't think they can, tell that to Paul who was beheaded in Rome. Tell that to Peter who, according to tradition, was crucified upside down. Tell that to Stephen who was stoned to death. Or to all the believers throughout the ages and maybe people you know who have paid with their lives um, for their faith in Christ. Or... Maybe not with their lives, but with their livelihood that their income was taken away and they were shunned from society and everything they had was taken away from them. Tell them that circumstances uh, will, you know, they can't be, they, they won't crush your lives. Tell them. They, they did. They did. Took everything away, even their lives. But there is a, there is a, a truth that is even more powerful than this picture that I just depicted. And that is, I am divinely enabled to endure those circumstances. And even if my life is taken away, I am still guaranteed life with God. And that He is my life. Even though my livelihood is taken away, even everything that I have and know is taken away, I'm, I'm still victorious in Christ Jesus because I submit to His will. I do what He says, even if that means I lose everything. And He will divinely enable me to endure and to be patient with joy. And the joy does not come from the circumstances that is quite evident. Uh, there, there's no reason for joy in my circumstances, but the joy comes from God. My eyes and my focus uh, is on Him. My eyes are on Him. And because I know that He is who He said He is, and that He is in control even though everything presses down on me, I know that in the end, God will bring me through, even if I'm killed. God will give me the crown of life. God will unite me with Him for all eternity. God will receive me in His uh, eternal kingdom. And that's where my joy comes from. Not from what I see right here and now. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, he says, Even though my outward man wastes away, yet my inward man is renewed day by day. And the difficulties that we experience, the trials and uh, tribulations that we go through uh, work for us an uh, eternal weight of glory because we do not look at that what is seen but at that that is unseen we look at what nobody else can see except those who are in who are united with christ what do they see they see the glory of christ they see the promises of christ they see the truth of Christ, and in that their joy is, uh, is anchored. Isn't that a powerful thing? Let's just read. We, maybe we can talk about it in the next video, but let's read the third effect of being filled with the will of God. And um, that would be, uh, let's, from verse uh, 12. Uh, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And the third thing, and we can talk about it in the next video, is giving thanks to God. You know, which brings, 
which brings the focus back to the fact that whatever happens to me, God is in control. Uh, and, that, and that even if Satan takes my life away, even, even in that situation and circumstance, God is in control and he has the final say. And my joy is in him. And I thank him for being in my life. I thank him that he is my life. I thank him that he reveals himself to me. And I thank him that he gives me life and will give me life when I meet him face to face. Which is such a, a wonderful thing. But let's talk about that in the next video.